to Olga and Kelsey for inviting us to give this uh, presentation about our uh, migration to IWD at Stanford. Um, and I'll both walk through um, what we've done with PyWD. So let's see, as a quick overview, um, we'll be talking about um, a little bit of background about Web Archives at Stanford, um, why we switched from Open Wayback to PyWD, um, how we went about making that switch, uh, and then how we updated the PyWD wrap up with um, some next steps that we can All right, so as context, the Stanford um, Library Web Archive Program started in 2012 with an internal grant of Berkeley. The organizational home is now the University Archives and Digital Library, and so we named it Peter Center to the Web Archivist. And the Web Archives are supported by uh, the Digital Library Systems and Services Unit within the library, and Ed and I are both on that team that supports the Web Archives. Here at Stanford, we primarily use Internet Archives Archive it service for crawling websites, although we are increasingly using other tools as well, and we'll say a little bit more about that later. The work data that we collect with Archivit is automatically collected, typically monthly, from Archivit using Wasabi. And those works are deposited in the Stanford Digital Repository as uh, what we call crawl objects. So this is a view of the repository staff management interface, Argo, showing an example crawl object from um, one of our Archivit collections. And we also have many accounts on the Archivit platform, but then we import it here into um, the repository. Uh, moving on, uh, our web archivist also create seed objects, we call them, to identify key web resources within crawls. And usually these are the website, these represent the website homepage uh, that was used as the seed in an archivist crawl. So these objects are created and used for discovery purposes. And you can see what that looks like. Um, this, the, these seeds get indexed and published in SearchWorks. This is our discovery and access system, our catalog. And you can see one of these seeds represented here. Uh, you see some metadata about it, a thumbnail for the website that was captured. And then uh, in that box there, along with the thumbnail, you see a list of the capture dates. And if somebody clicks on one of those links, those dates link out to uh, this Stanford Web Access Portal, we call it. We call it SWAP for short. <laughs> and it's now running on PyWD 2.7. So that's what you see right now here. Until last year, it was running uh, uh, using Open Wayback. And then just as for a final context, um, Ed pulled together this graph that shows the growth of the web archives over time. So we have about 50 terabytes of works. Uh, so about 6,725. Uh, seeds and over 21,000 works. And then, you know, even with this modest amount of data, it's still 1 billion snapshots of web resources. Like each snapshot here being a, a line as we do with this today. All right, so let's uh, I'll turn it over to Ed to talk about why we switched to PyWD. Yeah, okay. So, um, you know, things seem like they're going pretty well. So, like, why did we switch away from using Open Wayback uh, to PyWD? I imagine some of you probably already know the answer to this, but um, it's probably just worth worth saying. Um, so, <clears throat> the the main motivator for switching was uh, was replay, and so this is an example of a, a page um, from one of our collections. Is David Wolinski? Uh, uh, papers archive, um, which has some web content in it, and um, it, this was a survey monkey that, that he did when he was trying to research the um, the, the anniversary of the um, GamerGate phenomenon. And you know, we we archived his survey monkey page, and you know, when you look at it in Open Wave Act, this is what you saw. Um, so you should see some content here, but you see this rotten bananas, you know, um, message. 
Um, and, um, you know, when you look at it through PyWB, we found uh, that great, you know, the survey actually renders. Um, you're able to look at the responses to the, to the survey. This is what we actually wanted. So that's kind of like the obvious reason why we switched was hoping that this replay uh, improvement would be across the board. The, the other thing motivator was that when we used when we started using Open Wayback, uh, we forked it on GitHub and and we made uh, customizations to it to you know get get it to look like the Stanford um, website and and uh, and basically what happened is we got stranded on that fork. Um, we got into a place where we couldn't actually merge upstream changes from um, from the main repository, so we were kind of stuck. Um, and then. The other thing that happened too was that um, in 2021, you know, the, the project actually stopped. So, uh, you know, this is a just a view of the last commit to open way back. And um, yeah, so so we wanted to move to something that was going to be actively supported. Uh, so moving on to like how we actually did the switch itself. Um, uh, the main thing that we uh, did. I, I would say that structured our work was um, following um, the UK Web Archive's work on their IWD implementation. So they had a nice GitHub repository that we sort of modeled our own GitHub repository on, and um, and they basically use it, use it for configuration management of IWD. So all the, the customization, configuration, <clears throat> things like that. Uh, nice to put them into GitHub where they're version and um, we also use this for deploying the application. So a bit about the deployment itself. Um, we we use a tool called Poetry for managing the Python dependencies. It's actually very minimal. It's just really PyWV, <laughs> but uh, but it allows us to kind of control what versions get installed uh, automatically. Laura's going to talk about that in a moment. Um, because we're a Ruby shop, we actually use a tool called uh, Capistrano, um, which is a, a Ruby deployment tool. So um, you'll see in the GitHub repository there's some code related to that. Basically, we use it to, to push the application to different servers. Um, we do use Docker for development. Um, so when we're working on our workstations, we, there's a Docker Compose set up in the, in the GitHub repository for just running it locally. But then the production and other environments like staging, um, they use a virtual machine. Actually, it's pretty modestly sized. It's only four CPUs and eight gigabytes of RAM, which is kind of small these days. Uh, you know, the laptop you have probably is bigger than this. Um, and um, it sits on top of uh, what's called NetApp storage, but it's a network attached storage that we access through an NFS uh, file system. So the approach that we took to, um, to you know, moving over was that we decided to re-index all of our work data. It's only 50 terabytes, so compared to some of your collections, it, it might not seem that much, but uh, it was still you know, a significant commitment. Um, we used just a uh, web, reporter, web reporter CDXJ indexer uh, to do this. Um, we had a small little coordinating Ruby program to basically invoke CDXJ indexer and um, it ran across the 50 terabytes of work data in about five days um, and that was using 10 CPUs. Uh, and we did want to use this post append option on CDXJ indexer because it um, allowed for a richer playback of like really dynamic JavaScript applications so like social media content that needed to um, be able to post to the archive and um, in, in addition to getting, and uh, so we um, we did use that. Uh, one of the downsides to that was that um, we couldn't use Alpac CDX. Uh, so we, you know, Alpac CDX has kind of minimal CDXJ uh, support, but but once you start using post append, it doesn't work anymore. Uh, at least with those CDXJ files that we had. So I, I think that's still the case. I, I'm not 100% sure. So what do we do instead of using uh, Outback CDX? Well, we just use the built-in uh, CDXJ support that's that's in PyWB. Um, we actually use this approach that we borrowed from our use of Open Wayback, where we basically have uh, like a tiered index where 
Uh, there are four CSJ files that IWD will look at, and um, the, the first level is the, the current day, so things that we're adding to that day. Um, every week they get rolled up into level one, um, which is a weekly file, and then every month they get rolled up into a level two, and then every year they get rolled up into the level three. Um, and uh, we're just using the unit sort command to do that, it's merging these. They're already sorted, but the sort command has a merge option, which is pretty handy for that. The configuration looks pretty simple, you know, pointing it to the index paths where the CXJ files are and where the work data is. And then we do use the ACL uh, um, J file for limiting access to certain things. This is what Open Wayback used to look like, uh, or this is what Open Wayback looked like. Uh, it's not PyWD, but we did have to make some small changes to, to get like um, like the previous and next capture working. Um, actually, we're going to talk about this in a second again, um, and um, you know, just minimal kind of like branding up at the top left. So we had to replicate that in our PyWD configuration. And this is kind of like what the home page looks like. So if you go to swap.stanford.edu, um, you'll see a page like this, hopefully. Um, and you can see that we actually removed something from the default IWD um, home page, uh, like being able to search by media type and things like that. Um, Peter Chan, the web archivist, decided that, uh, you know, he, 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 he thought that it was a little bit confusing uh, for, for users. Um, to, to see that. Not that the functionality wasn't useful, but just to, we decided not to have it on the home page. Um, and we did actually want to add some like, you know, um, featured archive sites. So that those are basically just hard coded into the template. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's what it looks like. Oh, and, uh, one last thing, uh, is for this section, um, another change that we had to make was uh, the page that Laura mentioned that our discovery and access layer um, search works, it uh, needs to know what um, what captures are available for a particular website. And so the way that it does that is using the, the Memento API. Um, and luckily PyWD has that too, uh, just like Open Wayback did. So we basically just had to, to change a, a URL um, in the JavaScript that's doing that lookup. Or actually it's a 3D page that's doing that. But yeah, just had to update the URL. All right, so we were live on Q6 last July, and then um, Q7 came out with a whole bunch of improvements. So we started working on the upgrade while PyWD Q7 was in beta. Um, so that was like last October or so we started working on that. And then we switched to Q7 in January of 2023. And that timing was driven more by staff availability to test and the amount of work that it took to upgrade. It wasn't a significant change of work. Uh, so something to know about our environment is that every week a dependency update bot runs and checks to see if our Python or Ruby dependencies need to be updated and automatically submits a PR if they do. So um, we normally would have picked up the 2.7 upgrade when it was released since we try to avoid pinning as much as possible. But in this case, 2.7 would have, um, it did have some breaking UI changes. So we had pinned to uh, Q6 using poetry um, until we were ready to um, get something from the Q7. So you saw earlier that screenshot from PyWD Q6 that showed the next and previous links that we had to insert into the header there in order to switch to PyWD. Um, with 2.7 then, um, since this functionality was added back in by WebRecorder, we were able to back out our customizations and use these new buttons um, and have the calendar view and the timeline view. So our web arch archivist was really happy to see all these new features that had been um, previously available in Open Way Back and give users a, a way to navigate through the, <clears throat> through the archive in a way they may have been used to. Uh, in general, we were able to remove many of the customizations we had done in Q6 to override UI templates and JavaScript. So we removed a customized banner that we had put in there to show above um, the um, uh, 
uh, replay or, or replay header or the, sort of the date listing header. Um, it was showing up as a second header in that calendar view. Uh, so we didn't need to make that there anymore. We could customize that gray bar for the um, uh, frame insert, just use that. And then we made a new Stanford header to put only on our the collection search page, which you probably may know you may notice that acts as our top level page. We have everything in one collection, so the collection search page is really our, our home page. And then we were able to remove a lot of our custom style sheets uh, because we could use the new UI uh, block in the config.yaml to um, customize a lot of the colors and the logo. It was great to be able to participate with the IAPC community on this U7 beta testing. Um, I know a lot of you who are on the call also really participated in that. Um, that Vue.js UI uh, with the calendar and replay um, was completely new in Q7, and I think the community helped identify a lot of tweaks or bug fixes to help that um, be ready for release. So we've been live since January, like I said, with Q7. Um, we continue to monitor for changes and patch releases and try to upgrade Windows as they release. Although since we do have a little bit of some customized UI templates there that the JavaScript may interact with, like the search page, we do try to keep an eye out for, for those to see if um, we want to introduce any changes. Um, it also gives us an opportunity to create and do this kind of OC feature. Um, let's back over to Ed. So uh, we thought we'd just sort of end here by saying a little bit about what we're, you know, still working on and, and what's next. Um, so we do have a few unresolved issues like that we identified when we were doing the upgrade. Um, one is, and I guess this is, uh, yeah, like it, it came up. I think it, it, this this has been the case with Open Way Back as well, but like. We want to be able to be able to uh, remove particular crawls from the archive. So, like thinking about bad captures of particular pages or you know things PII related stuff. Um, we would like the search works interface to not show those. Um, this happens to be a, 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 a request that's been made before. Uh, Andy Jackson put in this issue back in 2022 about. Being able to add, you know, date ranges to um, to the ACLJ file, I believe. Um, and uh, Laura happened to know when we were just like looking um, last week that uh, this is another uh, request from Vasco Rasso at Archivo .pt. Um He basically is asking for a similar thing. So that's something we're hoping to work on or help with potentially. Um, Another thing we've noticed is that we do have some content. So, for example, googlevideo.com content, where we've got so many matches in the CDS file uh, that getting a response back using our, you know, the, the built-in uh, CDS support uh, is, is quite slow. Um, this isn't the case all the time, but it seems to be, in particular, uh, replay conditions, um, maybe related to fuzzy matching. We haven't gotten to the bottom of it, but uh, that's something that we're, we're kind of looking at. Um, and then I, I had mentioned this post-append issue and Outback CDX, and so we have kind of like an ongoing question about whether we want to revisit the way that we're doing uh, indexing in general. Um, uh, and yeah, so that's kind of a, a grab bag kind of issue. And uh, the other thing too we've noticed because we've been doing some collecting with um, Open Wayback, uh, sorry, with uh, um, BrowserTix Cloud, um, we uh, and also Archive Web Page, we've noticed content that kind of replays in the replay web page component in that environment well, but then when we take that WAXE file, unpack the work data, and index it into PyWD, it doesn't replay as well and. So we've noticed some like kind of parity issues between the two different environments, and, and so we're interested in sort of like helping move that forward um, somehow. Uh, open to ideas about the best way to do that. Um, <clears throat> some more things like kind of in the future, I guess, or things that are underway at the moment. Uh, we're we'd like to understand how people are using the web archive better. Um, we recently 
because we use Google Analytics elsewhere at the university, um, we're using it in PyWD, and we recently migrated it to Google Analytics 4. And when we did that, we actually added a little custom event, quite simple, just really just a line of JavaScript to be able to track uh, what websites are being looked at. So we're hoping that this data will give us a sense of, of how uh, people are interacting with the, with the archive. And, um, and yeah, you can help collection development uh, people at the library uh, give them feedback about the decisions they're making. Um, I mentioned Browser Cloud. Uh, we are still doing a pilot uh, for that with that with a uh, web recorder. So it's, it's hosted by web recorder. So we're very, very grateful for um, and uh, we're just going to be hopefully uh, continuing to do that uh, and, and Hopefully, should have some kind of report out about that. If, if definitely internally, like if there's interest uh, in it externally, just let us know. Um, and yeah, like we are interested in sort of like what the roadmap is for PyWD itself. Um, you know, what potentially, especially around these parity issues, um, and, and like what the roadmap for for version three might be. Um, and that. I think is it. I apologize if we went over a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, if you want to get in touch with us, definitely email us if you want or uh, contact Laura or I in, um, in Slack and, uh, and yeah, and ask questions now, <laughs> obviously. Thank you.